Hello and welcome. My name is Catherine McWilly. I'm the CEO of Custody Calculations, Calendars and Orders. I will be presenting on crime court and parental alienation. Before we begin, I want to provide the following information. My experience, background and training is that of a law enforcement officer. My presentation is based on that perspective. I have 33 years experience with dealing with family law. 24 years as a law enforcement officer with the Los Angeles Police Department, responding to radio calls, dealing with divorce and custody issues. I was also a first responder to child abuse investigations, as well as other assignments related to divorce and custody. I've conducted 10 years of research into the cause and effect of family law, and the last nine years I've been a child custody and divorce coach. I have clients all over the United States and internationally. This is an actual recording of an emergency response. This is what divorce and custody sounds like to many law enforcement officers across the United States. Emergency responses, lights, siren, and mayhem, varying only by the number of persons involved, victims, and degree of devastation. On January 26, 2005, at 6.03 in the morning, Juan Alvarez, depressed over his pending divorce, in a failed suicide attempt, slashed his wrists and stabbed himself in the chest. Determined to succeed in his next attempt, Alvarez came up with the brilliant idea to park his vehicle on the railroad tracks. As the train approached, Alvarez changed his mind, but was unable to start his truck and move it from the tracks. Instead, he jumped clear from the track to safety while the crowded commuter train struck his vehicle still on the tracks and was derailed, killing 11 and injuring over 200. In 2008, Alvarez was convicted of special circumstances and received 11 life sentences with no chance for parole. No one on that train ever heard of Juan Alvarez before that day. But each one of those passengers were impacted by his divorce long before he ever set foot in a courtroom or stood before a judge, creating a ripple effect of family law case on all of these lives. And there's no prior criminal history in any of the articles I reviewed on Juan Alvarez. Katz, Texas, August 27, 2004, Rick Lowenstrauss shooting. A 10-year-old boy sitting in the rear seat of his father's vehicle using a handgun taken from his mother's residence that he had concealed on his person fired several shots through the driver's seat killing his father. This incident occurred during a custody exchange outside the mother's residence. The father was an emergency room doctor, the mother and a nurse. Physicians rallied around the child as a victim of parental alienation. The case made headlines across the country due to the child's young age, and for the first time, the term parental alienation was heard by the general public. The child was ultimately convicted and sentenced to 10 years in a juvenile facility. At 16, he was released on appeal to his mother's care over the objections of the grandparents on the father's side who caught, sought custody of the boys. As expected for a child this young, no prior criminal history was referenced in any of the articles I reviewed on the case. Independence, Missouri, September 28, 2007. Sam and Libby Porter, only seven and eight years old when they died. Their father picked them up for his custodial time and they were never seen again. The father was convicted of parental killing kidnapping with the intent to terrorize his ex-wife and sentenced to 38 years. Conviction was obtained without the child's or the children's physical remains who had during the trial refused to provide any information on the children's whereabouts. Only upon the threat of being released into the general jail population did the father finally provide the location of where the children were buried. If you do not know, the prison can be a very deadly place for someone convicted of a crime against the child. Even prisoners have a code with regard to children. No prior criminal history was referenced in any of the articles I reviewed on this case. Full Share, Texas, June 27, 2016. Jason Sheets, 
thought his wife was going to tell their two daughters, Taylor, who was 22 years old, and Madison, 17, that their parents were getting a divorce when they all met at the house for a family meeting. Instead, the mother pulled out a handgun and fatally shot her daughters, chasing one of them into the street. One daughter died on scene, the second at the hospital. The mother was shot and killed by police when she refused to put down her weapon. The mother had ample time and opportunity to kill the husband, but chose not to. The father felt it was so that he would live every day the rest of his life suffering over the death of his two beloved daughters. No prior criminal history was referenced in any of the articles I reviewed on the mother, although articles did reference that the mother was being treated by a therapist and was on anti-anxiety medication at the time of the shooting. December 24, 2008, West Covina, California, dubbed the Santa Claus Massacre. 45-year-old Bruce Pardo, angry over his divorce and custody settlement, which was finalized only six days prior to the incident, wearing a Santa suit, disguised himself. He entered the residence where his ex-wife and relatives were celebrating the holidays. Hidden within the Santa suit, were four semi-automatic weapons and an incendiary device. When Prado left the residence, the house was engulfed in flames. Dead were nine family members, including Pardo's ex-wife, her mother, and father, who had just recently celebrated their 50-year wedding anniversary. Pardo himself was severely burned. Fleeing to his brother's residence, Pardo was discovered the following morning, where he lay dying from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. No criminal history was referenced in any of the articles I reviewed on the case on Bruce Pardo. Seal Beach, California, October 12th, 2011 at 1.21 p.m. The largest mass shooting in the history of Orange County took place. 41-year-old Scott Durecki was involved in a highly litigated custody dispute over his young son and had been in court the day prior. Scott Drecke shot his way into and out of the hair salon where his ex-wife worked. When he left, dead was his ex-wife, the salon owner, and five other persons, eight people who never heard of Scott Drecke, and one lone survivor who were not involved in his custody case died in the ripple effect of family law. The body count could have been significantly higher as Scott Drecke's vehicle contained additional weapons and ammo and he was wearing body armor when the officers took him into custody a short distance from the shooting. Scott Drecke pled guilty to the shooting on May 2nd, 2014. The penalty phase is still pending on the issue on the death penalty or life in prison without the possibility of parole as of April 2017. No prior criminal history is referenced in any of the articles that I read on the case, although Scott Drecke was on medication and working with a therapist related to a prior work injury. June 3rd, 2016, 6.20 p.m., a six-year-old child upset over his parents' divorce committed suicide. His death left many in the community and the police department wondering how could a child so young be capable of such an act? Four detectives were assigned to work the case exclusively to determine if the child did in fact commit suicide. It was beyond the comprehension of anyone that this could have happened. The child had previously been watching cartoons on the TV in the living room when he walked into the kitchen and taking off his belt, tied it into a makeshift noose and hung himself from the freezer handle of the refrigerator. His seven-year-old sister found him. His mother and stepfather were home, upstairs in the bedroom at the time of his death. The story made headlines as far away as the UK. The child in this story is very unusual due to his age, but in fact, between 2007 and 2013, four children aged seven have committed suicide as referenced in the article. Yearly, there are approximately 10,500 suicides in the United States related to family law, both committed by children and adults. Lake County, California, February 16, 2016. Luther Jones, convicted of child molestation in 1998, was released from prison after serving 18 years. Jones argued in his trial that his wife was trying to set him up because of their custody dispute over their then 10-year-old daughter. 
The jury did not believe Jones, and he was sentenced to 27 years. In 2016, his daughter, then 30 years old, contacted the district attorney's office and recanted her story, saying her mother had coerced her into making false statements against the father. Jones' release was expedited due to severe medical complications, and he died just a few months after his release. No prior criminal history was referenced in any of the articles I reviewed on the father on this case. And just as a follow-up, the Lake County District Attorney's Office, in response to this specific case, has set up a unit special to prosecute persons committing perjury, claiming that this was an ap epidemic in the court system with no consequences. This is the first such unit in existence in the United States, to my knowledge. Think this is an exception to just the United States and nowhere else? Wrong. In Canada, a police officer was convicted of child molestation and was released under similar circumstances after serving 19 years in prison when his two adult children recanted their stories. False allegations is a growing problem in, one, in family law. One client of mine has been arrested three times over the last several years and would have been arrested more if the other parent had had their way. No charges have ever been filed against the other parent for the false allegations. October 2011, New York. Sam Friedlander, an attorney in New York, shot his children and then tucked them into bed. In a murder-suicide, the father wiped out his entire family bludgeoning his wife first. He then used a 12-gauge shotgun to plast his pajama-clad children. The father then went down to the unfinished basement and fatally shot himself. The family was pending a court date that week on the divorce. No prior criminal history was referenced in any of the articles I reviewed on the case by the father. These scenarios are not limited to parents, but often involve other family members, too. December 9, 2011, Broward County, Florida. A 67-year-old grandmother attempted to shoot and kill her ex-son-in-law during a custody exchange of the granddaughter. He was arrested, then later released after the video on his cell phone proved it was the grandmother who did the shooting and not him. If convicted, the grandmother was looking at 30 years. Additional family members were arrested, included the mother of the child and her brother who obtained the weapon for the grandmother. No prior criminal history was referenced in any of the articles I reviewed on the case by the grandmother. Not long ago, a grandmother contacted me for help on behalf of her granddaughter. After two years, a sexual abuse investigation was identified as inconclusive. That's the term used to describe allegations investigated that cannot be proved or disproved. As a result, the father was granted unmonitored visitation and supervision as well as overnights with the child. Believing the child continued to be abused by the gra father, the grandmother, then 79 years old, who had never fired a weapon in her life, tried to kill the father by shooting him. No surprise, she missed. The grandmother was convicted and sentenced to a mental institution for one year. The court believed that the child's mother had knowledge that the grandmother was going to attempt to shoot the father and strip the mother of her custody. The child now lives full time with the father. Upon the grandmother's release, she contacted me. The grandmother wanted my help in restoring her daughter's custody and proving the sexual abuse allegations which she continues to believe are true due to the statements by the child. The case is pending. The grandmother had never been arrested and had no prior criminal history until this shooting. In fact, my own research of 10 years identified that family law may be responsible for 25% of the crime in the United States. Homicides, suicides, abductions, child abuse, domestic violence, violation of restraining orders, violation of court orders, stalking, and more. To put just one of those numbers into perspective, that's approximately 3,500 to 4,000 homicides a year related to divorce and custody issues. Even more disturbing to us in law enforcement is the increase in the number of child homicides, children murdered by their own parents in the ultimate act of retribution, revenge, and parental alienation against the other parent. 
In fact, the Department of Justice reported that children under the age of five were more likely to die of a homicide than cancer in the United States prior to 2012. In the United States, Social Services conducts 3.5 million child abuse investigations a year, impacting 6 million children in the United States. That is more children than the entire countries of Norway, Sweden, Finland, Belgium, and Denmark. Unofficially, however, the number of investigations is closer to 12 million due to cross-reporting and multiple investigations conducted by each agency, even within their own organization, with little recognition that each of these interviews and examinations is traumatizing the children. Each step of the process on both false and valid allegations, something that is relatively unknown, undiscussed, in or outside the courtroom. 40% of these child abuse investigations are identified as inconclusive. Again, I stated earlier, inconclusive is the term that social service is unable to prove or disprove the allegations. Of that 40%, 90% of this group is believed to be parents or others acting on their behalf, using investigations to gain an advantage in custody. Now that's an unofficial assessment, but that's feedback from actual social workers in the field. False allegations of child abuse, domestic violence, and false restraining orders have become a silver bullet in family law as the shortest and quickest route to primary or sole custody for one parent over the other. Driving that point home even further is the estimate that in the United States, we may now be spending as much as a billion dollars a year on restraining orders alone. Now, I cannot say definitively that this percentage is correct. This is a best guess, if you will, because law enforcement does not track causative factors. But in fact, 25% may be too conservative a number and the actual percentage may be much higher, especially when you consider statistics and information related to child abductions and homicides. United States is not alone in horrific crimes dealing with family law, which are not confined to a single gender, country, or even continent. On February 11, 2015, Lenik Belgium, Thoreau Morbo, 35-year-old mother, in a rage over her husband's attorney, who sent a letter requesting full custody of the children, locked Madison, who was only six years old, Abigail, four, and Omni, two, in a storage shed. Then she set the shed on fire, burning the children alive. Thero called the father, holding up the cell phone so the father could hear the screams of the children, and she said, I will never surrender my children to you. The one child that did survive was not at home at the time of the incident. She was also a child from a previous marriage on the father's side, not the mother. No prior criminal history was referenced in any of the articles I reviewed on the case by the mother prior to this incident. Australia, November 2009, dubbed the Facebook murderer Rama Askar, a father, murdered his two-year-old daughter, stabbing her in the stomach and chest and left her to die in a wooded area after posting on Facebook. He also sent the mother a text that said, how does it feel not to have your child when I did not have mine for three months? The father pled guilty. No prior criminal history was referenced in any of the articles I reviewed on the case. There is no shortage of headlines around the globe dealing with family law on these issues. They run the gamut from mild to absolutely horrific. And the number of headlines is increasing weekly, monthly, yearly, everywhere, not just the United States. The argument that parental alienation does or does not exist continues to rage on in U.S. courts, leaving in its wake a body count of physical, emotional, and financial ruin that will be felt for generations. Complicating the matter further is that parental alienation is still the most expensive, most difficult, and least successful argument in the U.S. courts, which is why I tell parents all the time, avoid the argument entirely and focus on the contempt, the law. This is the simplest and least expensive argument and has none of the controversy of parental alienation. Many parents view the court system as re rewarding the aggressive bully parent 
unfairly victimizing parents who do adhere to the law and do follow the court orders, a perception that I personally cannot argue against after 33 years of dealing with family law, both as a law enforcement officer and as a child custody and divorce coach. Why I tell parents, you can get better odds in Vegas. Parents often become so ravaged by the divorce and custody process that they suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, losing their ability to maintain employment, pay bills, or function on a daily basis, falling into depression, and in some cases, loss of life. I just recently had a client pass away during the divorce process related to se severe injuries from a car accident, a frequent occurrence for families going through divorce. I personally have had clients that could not put two sentences together and had to communicate through relatives until they could function enough to communicate with me directly. Parents unable to mail their divorce papers just upon the thought of entering the divorce process who instead mailed their documents to me and then I forwarded them to the attorney. The windfall of monies paid or lost based on the parent that can either take or keep custody creates huge incentives, both financially and emotionally, against the parents who are vulnerable to their emotions or seeking retribution or revenge against the other, who, left to their own devices, escalate their aggressive behavior unencumbered by any consequences of the courts against that parent. Further, the courts, by their very lack of action, actually encourage, support, and escalate the very behavior they say they deplore. Not the goal, but it's still the result, none the same. The courts, in effect, have become the greatest promoter of lawlessness under their policy of best interest of the children, with statements that if we punish a parent, we'll be punishing the child, and we don't want to punish the child for the actions of the parent, or... How do I make a 14, 15, or 16-year-old child visit the other parent? Can we fix this? Without hesitation, I tell you yes. Can we stop or reduce parental alienation with a few statements in court? Yes. Can we stop or reduce violations of court orders with a few statements in court? Yes. Can we reduce crime, homicides, suicides, abductions, child abuse with enforcement of court orders? Yes. Can we restore the integrity of our courts by enforcing court orders? Absolutely yes, I say to all of these statements. Now, if you want to know what that looks like and sounds like, which I certainly can't go into based on time restrictions, contact me for a presentation specific to these issues. Now, please excuse the law enforcement analogy, but from my perspective, this is pretty black and white for I've never heard it said as a law enforcement officer, we're having problems with robberies, burglaries and thefts in this particular section of the city. So let's not enforce any of the laws and see if that makes things better. Give the bad guys a chance to make better decisions. Or if we catch a burglary or a robbery suspect and they are parents, we should release them because we would be punishing the children for the actions of their parents and we don't wanna punish the children. If we put these criminals in jail, who's going to care for the family or the relationship with their children will be impacted? We can't do that. Or we need to stop writing tickets to families because they can't afford it. Sounds pretty ridiculous when you hear it said out loud, doesn't it? But that's exactly what courts say and do every day, not just in the United States, but other countries too. The reality is that without law and order, we have total chaos in society. So how is it that we are surprised that we now have total chaos in family law due to lack of enforcement? Specific to this conference, until we can do a better job in family law, the mental health component is critical if we are to get these cases right. We absolutely need your help. It is also important that we recognize that the bully parent will nearly always look good and sound good versus the targeted parent who, being blocked from seeing their children or only sporadically seeing their children, will nearly always fail to speak or present well in counseling, evaluations, court, and with other divorce professionals. In addition to these issues, targeted parents are, in a growing number of cases, dealing with false allegations, false restraining orders, and false police reports 
often being arrested on these allegations, breaking them emotionally and financially, and further hindering their ability to present well under this additional strain. Now, let me be clear. I am not saying that valid allegations of abuse do not occur during divorce and custody proceedings. They absolutely do. I am only addressing false allegations filed in an attempt to gain an advantage in the divorce and custody proceedings or later in continued litigation dealing with custody. We also need to recognize that the alignment of children with the bully parent can also be an indicator of parental alienation, especially when the bully parent is seen by the child as all good and the targeted parent is seen as all bad and where there is no justification for this position to be held by the child. I would go so far as to say in some cases, getting it right is quite literally a matter of life and death for children and adults. None of the parents referenced in any of these presentations had any criminal history prior to entering the divorce and custody process, even in cases involving parents who murdered their children or the other parent, which begs the question, are parents vulnerable to these scenarios given the right environment or have the courts literally driven parents to these behaviors based on the method and manner in which family law court functions or both? Don't we owe it to families to get the answers? In the process, we need to be asking other questions we've identified, and I say we, my company custody calculations that we need to look at. One example might be possible biases that the court may be an entirely unaware of and should be addressed. Single parent households versus married spouses. Again, due to time constraints, I'm unable to explore those issues more fully today. I've secured funding to research causative factors of crime at law enforcement agencies around the country in the United States. Research criminal history, track court dates, and other factors of risk to determine if we can identify triggers in advance and save lives. In closing, a famous line from the Huffington Post, marriages come and go, but divorce is forever. Truer words were never spoken. Now, my PowerPoints are copyright protected, but the use of the PowerPoints by written consent is permitted with credit to custody calculations, calendars, and orders. Again, my name is Catherine McWilly, the CEO of Custody Calculations, Calendars and Orders. My website is custodycalculations.com. If you wish to contact me, you may do so at Catherine, C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, -E, at custodycalculations.com. Our corporate number is 702-375-9389. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present on this important subject today. Thank you.